What is up YouTube? Today I'm coming back at you with another video. Today's going to be a photography related video and we're going to be reviewing a micro four thirds lens. For those of you who don't know, um, when, I, when I do photography and when I film my videos on is micro four thirds. I really, really like micro four thirds for a lot of different reasons. It's actually my preferred system. And um, I've tried full frame. I have a Canon full frame camera with a 50mm f1.4 and I like it a lot. It's just very heavy. And I actually think that the depth of field is too thin sometimes with that. And um, I actually really like using Micro Four Thirds because I find it, it it's, a, it's a, my ideal balance between lightweight and um, professional, professional look. But today we're going to be looking at, I don't remember if I already said this, but today we're going to be looking at the 45mm f1.2 Olympus Pro Lens. Um, so yeah, uh, basically what we're going to do is we're just going to, first we'll take a look at the build quality, we'll talk a little bit about the build quality of the lens, then I'll move on to what things I like about the lens, and then we'll move on to things I don't like about the lens. And this is going to be my long term opinions, I bought this lens when it first came out, and I've probably shot a couple thousand pictures with it at this point, uh, but by no means am I a professional. Uh, I am basically just a hobbyist. I, I just take pictures because I love photography. I don't make any money off my photography. I have done events in the past, but normally I don't. Uh, I would say about 99.9% .9 of my photography is just stuff that I do for myself. Which um, some people may think that this lens is a little bit of overkill for that, but um, it's just the lens that I, that I wanted and it's the lens that I bought, so uh, yeah. Take that with what you will. So, uh, first things first, let's talk a little bit about the build quality of this lens. So this uh, lens is built of 100% uh, metal and glass, basically. At least from what I can tell. If there is plastic in here, they do a good job of hiding it. Um, you've got a metal mount, as you would expect. You do have a, a small weather sealing gasket, as this is supposed to be weather resistant. Uh, to which I can attest, I have used this lens in uh, heavy, heavy snow. I have used this lens in, in light drizzle as well, and it has held up fine. It has a function button on the side, which you can program if you have an Olympus camera to whatever various different functions you want. It has your manual focus clutch, which I absolutely love. Uh, it's, a, it's a great feature to have. And um, it's got a 62 millimeter filter thread. Um, so before we go into what I like and what I don't like about this lens, first I want to say two things, well one thing basically about something that you will need, at least in my opinion, that you will need for uh, if you purchase this lens. So if you buy this lens um, for whatever reason you buy it for and you want to take advantage of that weather sealing um, advantage, I highly, highly recommend using a some sort of clear UV filter. Um, now I know a lot of people don't like using these because they, they, they deem them unnecessary. But um, in large part they are necessary for protecting the front optic because they are quite resilient. But in terms of weather protection I find that having that extra seal on the front element um, can basically, it's like an extra precaution and an extra crevice that the water would have to seep into to even get to the weather sealing gaskets. So I find it uh, I find that if you want to use this lens, especially in various different weather conditions, I recommend getting a clear UV filter. Now, I don't recommend, I know a lot of re people recommend just cheaping out and getting the cheapest glass one you can find. I don't recommend that because there's definitely a lot of different types of quality of glass. And what you're really paying for when you pay for an expensive filter is high quality, low uh, dispersion glass, which basically means there is uh, very little uh, amounts of air pockets because every piece of glass has air pockets no matter how microscopic they are. Um, but basically what you're paying for is the ultra refined glass. And uh, so I recommend something like I have a Hoya one on here. It cost me I think $60 or something. And that's something that I would recommend uh, if you want to take advantage of the weather sealing feature. Now another thing I recommend is another filter. I highly, highly recommend getting a ND filter. If you want to shoot this lens wide open, this is a necessity. And I also recommend getting an expensive ND filter for this lens, because number one, you paid for the expensive optic, you might as well get a nice filter for it. Number two, expensive ND filters are very, very beneficial because they create less color casting when you're using them. 
Uh, so I've got a B and W uh, three stop ND filter. I'm not sure if it's B and W B plus W. I never understood how you actually say their name, so I'm just going to call them B and W. And uh, I picked their three stop ND filter because I find that's a nice balance. Um, if I feel like if you went in more than three stops, you might actually have problems with shutter speeds um, in certain instances. And I feel like if you went less than that, you still might hit the shutter speed cap on your camera. So I find a three stop ND is sufficient enough. So I, and I went with the B&W brand. Um, and it produces a wonderful image with very little loss in sharpness and almost zero color cast, which I really, really like. So those are the two things that I recommend you getting. A clear uh, filter and a three stop ND filter um, for those two different reasons. Now, let's talk about the things I like about this lens. So, one of the first things that I really, really like about this lens and one of the things that's probably the most noticeable about this is the focus clutch mechanism. Now, uh, you may be thinking, um, it's kind of unnecessary, which it can be. Especially if your camera has um, eye detection like mine does. I'm using a Panasonic G7. Uh, it's what I do all my photography and videos on, and right now I'm using eye detection autofocus, and it works really, really well. However, um, with depth of field this thin, sometimes I find that um, it, it, it focuses, but um, there it can, it can be focused on the eyelash and not the actual pupil itself. Sometimes that can happen. So this uh, focus clutch is very, very handy for manual focus for that reason. You can ever so slightly adjust the focus. Or if you want to just do manual focus only, that works really well with the peaking in this camera. And what I like about the manual focus is, if you've ever shot with a film camera, this feels very, very close to shooting with an actual analog film camera lens. and. Um, I don't know what it is, but I feel like just the dampening on the on the ring itself, and just the, the hard stops, and the the responsiveness of the motor, it just really makes it feel almost like you're actually moving the actual glass elements with your hand. But in reality, all the focus clutch is really doing is adding hard stops and adding a linear progression to the turn of the ring itself. Otherwise, it, func it functions the exact same as if you don't have the focus clutch pulled where um, you spin it. It, it. I mean, there's no difference. It's just the way that the motor is working is just a slight di bit different. So I, I really like that focus clutch mechanism as it makes it feel a lot more like a real analog lens. Now, another thing I really like about this is the performance at f1.2 is just amazing. It's it's super duper sharp, like tack sharp in the, in, the, in the dead center. It is amazing, which makes it really great for portraits. And it's incredibly useful f from f1.2. And it does get sharper as you stop it down. Um, if you stop it down to f2, that's when it reaches its peak, its peak sharpness, and it pretty much stays there until like f11, where diffraction starts coming in. But at f1.2, f it is sharper than a lot of other Micro Four Thirds lenses I've, I've used. It's sharper than the lens I'm shooting on right now, um, which is the Leica 25mm f1.4. And it, it's just an amazing performance. Now there are some optical issues at f1.2, not many, but there are some. Um, there is some, some a little bit, not a, it's actually quite impressive, there's not a lot, but there is a little bit of uh, fringing um, in high contrast areas, uh, especially towards the edge of the frame at 1.2. You also see a little bit of a sharpness uh, drop off toward, as you as you move to the corners. Not much, like it's quite usable as you move to the corners. So it, uh, it's not something I'd be too concerned about. But there is a sharpness drop off, as you would expect from a sh lens being shot wide open. And there is quite a bit of vignetting, um, actually a heavy amount of vignetting uh, shot wide open. But that's easily fixed in post processing. So uh, that's not something I'd be concerned about really either. Um, some other things I really like about this lens is just the durability of this lens uh, is just fantastic. Like I said, the build quality is really good and I can really attest to the weather sealing in this lens being really great. Uh, it's held up perfectly fine in the conditions that I've shot it in and it's just optically hasn't been changed at all by uh, the conditions I've shot it in, which is great. Um, now, 
let's move on. I mean, that's really all you re can really ask for in a lens, I guess, is, is, is that. Um, it also really, it, its autofocus speed is quick, but not the fastest I've ever used. I will say that the autofocus is very, very quick, but not the fastest on Micro Four Thirds. So um, if that may, means anything to you, um, you might want to consider that as well. Now let's move on to some of the things I don't like. Um, one of the things I don't like about this is going to be kind of nitpicky, really, because it's kind of something you expect with this type of lens, but the weight. Um, it is a heavier lens for Micro Four Thirds. So in comparison, uh, this is my Panasonic 100 to 300. Um, this is actually quite compact for what it is, but it is quite hefty. But if you compare the weight to the 45 millimeter, they're almost exactly the same, but the 45 millimeter might even be a little bit heavier. So it is a dense lens. Um, so that means that when you're using it on your camera, you're definitely gonna feel it if you use a neck strap and it might be front heavy on your camera. However, like I said, it's something that you kind of expect when you buy this lens, with the kind of lens it is. Um, so it's not anything really unexpected. Another thing I don't really like about this lens is obviously the price. So this lens it can come in at the full retail price, I believe, that I paid for it was $1,200 US dollars. And um, they don't really go for that much anymore. That was like brand new back then. But these days, it tends to go around $1,000, which is still very, very expensive for a Micro Four Thirds lens. So um, that is one kind of downside to this lens. Um, but if, like I said, if you want the best quality, you have, you're gonna have to pay those sorts of prices on any camera system, really. So um, that's another thing. Uh, another thing I dislike about this lens is uh, this function button, actually. Um, number one, I don't, even if I could, I don't really want to use that function button, so it's kind of unnecessary to me. But number two, this button doesn't work on my camera because I don't shoot with an Olympus camera. So I don't get that, that function button uh, usability. Now I've heard that in recent updates on the, G, on the G9 that you can use it, but uh, on my camera I can't. So that's kind of a downside for me and some, something to keep in mind if you're trying to buy this lens uh, and you're using a Lumix camera. Now, um, other than that, uh, there's not really many things I can say that are negative about this. Um, and I've pretty much touched on all the things um, that I really like about it. Oh, I guess I could go back and, and talk about a little bit about some of the things I like about it. Um, I do really like the out of focus rendering. Uh, the bokeh quality is very, very smooth. It's, um, uh, they use what, they're, what they call their feather bokeh technology. And it is, it, it's honestly, you can tell the difference. It, the edges, it, it really, it's not so much that the, the backgrounds are creamier, it's more of the edge dispersion of the bokeh balls are more evenly dis, there's less of a hard line there. And I think that that really works out well, especially for portraits, which is what you would want. And um, now some people may say that that actually kind of, uh, comes in at a, at a cost. Um, some people really like character in their lens. I find that this lens lacks a lot of character. Um, it is very precise. You'll get a lot of precision out of this lens with very little character, unless you consider the feathered bokeh a character, which I kind of consider that more precision because that's something more desirable. There's, it's, it's an expected effect and you can analyze it and you can reproduce it easily. Whereas character kind of comes from flaws in the lens and unpredictability. Um, that's not a lot, that's not something you don't get with this lens is unpredictability, which can be a good thing. I find it a good thing because I know exactly what I'm gonna get from it. But some people are looking for that sort of unpredictability um, in their lenses. So whether or not that's something you want uh, is gonna be up to you. Um, but yeah, so those are the things I basically like and dislike about this lens. Overall, what would I say about this lens? Would I recommend this lens? Yes, for the right person. If you're willing to spend the money and you have the money to spare and you want the best portrait lens, definitely recommend this lens. It is a no-brainer. If you were trying to get into photography but keep your kit light, do not get this lens. This lens is heavy. This thing's probably gonna weigh more than most Micro Four Thirds cameras. So this is not a lens I would recommend for somebody who's trying to travel light. Um, or small, because this, this takes up a significant amount of space. Um, it's probably, 
it, I mean, it, it is an incredibly dense lens. It's, it's very large for micro four thirds. It's probably larger than most of the primes you're gonna have. So if you're trying to keep it small, don't get this lens. Um, and I also don't recommend it for anybody who's just getting into photography at all. Um, because if you're just getting in photography, you don't know what focal lengths you're gonna like. I recommend getting the cheapest focal, the cheapest prime lens and the focal length you wanna try before you decide to buy something like this. If you know that you want a portrait style 90 millimeter equivalent, then by all means, go for it. But if you don't know, this is not the lens to go for. This is a lens that you invest in when you know exactly what you want. And this will provide exactly what you're looking for if you know what you want. Otherwise, I would recommend the Olympus 45mm f1.8 for a lot of other people. Um, but if you, if, if you can afford it and if it's what you're looking for is that super shallow depth of field, that incredible open sharpness, and that weather ceiling, this is for you. Um, there's no other complaints I can really have about it. It is a phenomenal lens, near flawless, and um, it's fantastic. Well, probably one of my favorite, it's my favorite lens on Micro Four Thirds. So. Um, I'll stop rambling now, because I know I, I tend to ramble quite a bit, and uh, I'll show you some sample images. So most of these sample images are going to be obviously going to be portraits. I'll try to throw a few landscapes in there as well, so you can see um, sort of what sort of sharpness you can expect from a landscape. But I tend to shoot this thing at f1.2 almost always. Um, I very rarely stop it down, except for when I'm shooting uh, closer portraits. Uh, I'll normally stop down to f1.8. So pretty much all these shots you're gonna see are gonna be shot at f1.2. And I'll throw in a, an example of what I was talking about, or I don't think I actually mentioned it, I meant to mention it. Um, one downside is if you're shooting at f1.2 uh, and you're shooting a shoulder and up portrait, and sometimes you can get the neck out of focus significantly compared to the chest. And I find that an unflattering look. Um, I don't mind if the ears are out of focus, but if the neck is out of focus, if the neck is significantly out of focus and the chest is like really in focus, you kind of have this weird illusion of like completely in focus, not in focus at all, completely in focus on the chest. It, it just looks weird and I don't like it. So some people might not care, but I do. So I'll throw an example of that in there as well. Um, normally that only really happens at f1.2, so uh, yeah. But most of what you're going to see are some portraits of my girlfriend and some other people. And uh, like I said, I'll throw in um, some nature shots or, or um, I'll just throw in a pretty much a, a, whatever I've got with this lens. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what you guys think in the comment box below and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you guys for watching. Peace.